Whether you are six or 96, it is important to keep your brain functioning and fit for as long as you may live. It's no secret a healthy human brain is intimately connected to a healthy human body. Dr. Max Sinatter is a scientist and brain researcher who directs the Brain Research Center at UBC, and it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Max Sinatter back to Studio 4 to talk about the brain some more. Very nice to be here, Fanny. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. Mm -hmm. And so one of our uh, resolutions is to keep our <laughs> noggin fit. Absolutely. And uh, functioning. That's right. However, there's something about uh, after all the Christmas mayhem, mm -hmm. you have those days when you're just a little spacey. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, it does <laughs> happen. Think, I don't know what's going on in my brain, but I just can't seem to focus today. Is That's there right. a part of the brain that activates when we're <laughs> spaced out? Spaced well, out? Well, you know, it turns out to be really pretty interesting because, you know, when you study people and you, like, you know, you, you look at them, say, during a lecture and you ask them, okay, are you paying attention? Well, you know, a third of the time, they're not actually paying mm. attention. And, uh, you know, when you ask people a hundred times during the course of their working day, are you actually working or are you you know, spacing out or thinking mm -hmm. about nothing. It turns out that you spend a surprising amount of your time, even the, quote, best of us, just thinking about nothing or in reverie. And yeah, it, so people have now cottoned on to this um, and they've identified a brain network that really seems to turn on, especially when you're spacing out, mm -hmm. when you're in reverie, when you're thinking about nothing. And, uh, you know, at some level it's not a bad thing because your brain needs downtime. Mm. Uh, it's been shown, for instance, that if you're sleep deprived, even during the day, little parts of your brain will take naps while you're, <laughs> really? while you're, yeah, while you're supposedly on the air. <laughs> <laughs> that will happen. But this default network um, is useful because it lets you sort of process things in the background and sort of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, dream a little bit while you're awake. But it's the opposite of concentrating on your task. So let's say, you know, you're trying to solve a problem at work or at school and, you know, you got to concentrate on it. Well, if you're, if this reverie network, this default network as they call it, is active, you can't do that. And the evidence now that is accumulating is that as we get older, we're less able to switch this thing off. Really? Yeah. So that, you know, you're thinking about nothing in particular, you know, mm. you're sort of spacing mm -hmm. out a little bit. La, like, la, la, la. La, la, la. Welcome to Lotus Land. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got to get on task. You've got to deal with a particular problem. Well, when we do brain scans in our center now, what we see is when we do this with 20-year-olds, they switch off this default network and they switch on the task network. Okay. And, they re and they're on task. And you do this even with pretty fit 60 and 70-year-olds and they can't, they don't totally switch it off. It's still there in the background. This, this default network. And so what's happening is that they're just not able to turn it off as much, and so they can't devote as, devote as much of their cortical horsepower mm -hmm. to the task right. because some fraction of it is still spacing out. When you watch a child, a young child, a six-year-old, yeah. uh, put Lego together. Yeah, absolutely. Anything can happen around them pretty yeah, much, and they right. are putting yeah. Lego together they and that's are, what they're, they're doing. doing. Yeah, you see, so the ability to really concentrate becomes mm. actually very important. And some of the newer concepts are that the distinction between memory and the ability to concentrate is now blurring. Because if you can't concentrate, if you can't pay attention to something fully, your ability to remember that is going to go down. 
If you were scanning a brain uh, yeah. and somebody has what's called monkey brain, busy brain. Busy brain. And yeah. I don't know what happens. Sometimes it happens in the night, sometimes in the day. day. And you're here, we're talking yeah. about the yeah. brain. Yeah. And I might be thinking about uh, groceries Series, or uh, exactly. U.S. election or the next yeah. guest. And, that's, and what you see then is just lots of, like, imagine that, you know, the brain is like a, you know, your cortex is like a sheet. Right, so it's actually only two millimeters thick, your cortex, and you know it's all crumpled up uh, uh, inside your head. And if you could stretch it out, it'd be about this big by this big. And what happens is, when you're on task, when you're paying attention, what you have is big focus of activity in one part of your brain, like a, a mountain swelling up of activity. Now, when you're in this monkey brain situation where you're thinking about everything, mm -hmm. what you've got is all these little mountains of activity. And the idea is to try to get rid of this uh, default network, get rid of these many little mountains, and get to one big mountain that you can concentrate on. Is that why it's important, they say, to do the New York Times crossword or Sudoku or, or some kind of game that you can completely get lost in? Uh, Frogger? I don't well, know. Well, I think, you know, it's like everything else. If you learn to concentrate, if you learn to work hard, if you learn to focus, you'll get better at focusing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is one of the advantages of mindfulness meditation, which I don't do, but there's more and more evidence mm -hmm. that it's actually very good for you. What it does is it enables you to build up your ability to concentrate on one thing at a time, to live in the moment. Sure, you a know. musical brain, a math brain. There's a yeah. connection between music and math, as Absolutely. you know. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very well, Music has an underlying mathematical structure. Uh, some of the uh, people that I know that are some of the best mathematicians are also incredibly talented at music. And that seems to be, uh, you know, it seems as though, you know, there's a connection between those two parts, parts sure. of your sensorium. So, so what happens in the brain, uh, you're in a major debate, uh, say a, a, a debate uh, in front of millions for the U.S. primary, <laughs> <laughs> and you can't remember the three agencies in the United States you'd like to eliminate. Absolutely. <laughs> and that did happen. So what's going on? Stress? What's your brain doing? Um, well, you know, there's so much we don't yet understand about the retrieval process. Obviously, Rick Perry yeah. knew what three agencies he wanted to eliminate uh, a half hour earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when you're under a lot of stress, what it tends to do uh, is really to dishevel your brain. And you wind up in a situation, you wind up in this situation where there's so many things popping up, mm -hmm. and you can't regulate that. Right. So, what we're trying to do is in our Brain Research Center is to understand the actual biochemistry. What is it about the brain that puts it in that state where hundreds of things are always popping up versus being able to concentrate mm -hmm. on one thing? And that's also going to be part of the retrieval process. If you can't concentrate, you're not going to be able to get back that sure. one thought that you sure. need. So you have to be present. And speaking of presence, uh, what are you doing with the $15 million, the wonderful gift? from a very generous philanthropist. Well, uh, you know, thank you for uh, uh, bringing that up. Uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, you know, tell people it's, it's been announced publicly now that uh, uh, we've received a $15 million gift from Dr. Javad Moafagian uh, in support of our new Javad Moafagian Center for Brain Health. And uh, this is a new facility which is about, which is actually under construction on the UBC campus. The total project is about ninety million dollars. Really? Oh yeah, it's a it's going to be a hundred and fifty thousand square foot uh, new uh, facility, the Center for Brain Health. It's about a third provincial, third federal, and about a third uh, private sector and philanthropy and uh, uh, philanthropy funding, and it's going to, I believe, really change the way we do business with regard to dealing with uh, issues around brain health in British Columbia. Like stroke issues? <clears throat> like stroke issues, for instance. <clears throat> what we're going to do is really bring together the best of medical care, the families, the patients, with the best of uh, research. We're going to bring together care, clinical research, basic research, all in one facility <clears throat> in which Every patient is a research subject. Okay, so if you've had, and I know there's such a thing as a silent stroke. 
Absolutely. I, what is the difference between a silent stroke and the other stroke? Well, <clears throat> stroke is a, an extremely a common problem, as you know. <coughs> Excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, and it's, uh, it increases with age. But it turns out that only about, you know, even though there are about 50,000 strokes a year, it turns out that probably only about a quarter of all strokes are actually noticed and diagnosed. So if, when, we, when we do brain scans in our center, um, if you look at, say, a normal 65-year-old, that's going to happen to you and me, Fanny, someday. You it, think? It will happen someday in the well. distant future. Uh, <laughs> um, Thank you for if, that. <laughs> if we, uh, when we do brain scans of normal 65-year-olds, what we find is that almost 20% of them already have evidence in their brains of having had a small stroke in the past. And that's probably a silent stroke. Imagine a stroke that isn't so serious that it gives you one of the big warning signs, right. or you know, or you notice it. You know, you may have a splitting headache, which is one of the, or you may be dizzy, which is another of the mm. warning signs, or you may even have some muscle weakness or something like that. But you know, it's brief and it doesn't last. But there's damage. Uh, and, and will that lead to a major stroke, or can it, or does it? Uh, certainly it increases the increases odds. Increases the yeah, risk. It increases the risk for sure, but it's not a good thing in and of itself. You know, what you, you know, what's happened now that is, is that a part of your brain is now dead and isn't working. And so that, of course, uh, not only increases the odds for later problems, right. um, but you know, what you may notice is that Uncle Fred just isn't quite as sharp as he used to be. Okay. And you say he's getting old, but that's because, you know, he's now, uh, you know, uh, had some brain damage. These things are not independent of each other. So, for instance, it turns out that, you know, we're learning a lot about how the plaques and tangles uh, that form in the brain of uh, Alzheimer's patients uh, are actually formed. And it turns out that if a part of your brain isn't getting enough blood supply, which is what happens to the part in the stroke zone and around the stroke mm -hmm. zone, and even after concussions and other things, it turns out that that promotes the growth of the plaques and tangles that are the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. So it's not getting enough blood supply. It's, it's not because getting I would think a stroke you would have leakage. Well, you, leakage is not good either. So there are really two kinds of strokes. There's a ischemic stroke in which uh, a blood vessel is blocked then you're not getting enough blood supply beyond the blockade. Even in a hemorrhagic stroke, which is where, where a blood vessel bursts, mm -hmm. you're still not getting enough blood beyond the burst part because sure. the blood's just of leaking out into the brain. That's also not a good thing. No. So in both those situations, you're promoting the growth of the plaques and tangles that cause Alzheimer's disease. So what should you be doing? You really have to find ways to keep your circulation in the best possible shape. Cardiovascular so, exercise. Cardiovascular exercise. Yoga. Resistance training. Eat right. <laughs> eat less. Uh, you have everything you can do to support your heart is going to support your brain. So this uh, one and a half kilos of brain actually takes up 20% of your circulation. Really? So when we come back, let's talk about the heart-brain connection. Okay, let's okay. do that. Dr. Max Sinatter, our guest, he is the director of the Brain Research Center at UBC.